Deep inside every one of us is a lion waiting to be unleashed. Are you ready to be unleashed into your destiny? As we stand on the edge of time, the web of deception is being unraveled. Carl Joseph offers you the red pill and the keys to unlock the shackles of your mind. Get ready to be transformed by God's supernatural power. Let's join him now. Friend, I'm talking today about the religion of Buddhism. Now, it's estimated that about 6% of the world's population are practicing Buddhists, which would equate to about 420 million across the globe. The precise number of followers is difficult to ascertain because of Buddhism's ability to assimilate itself into any culture and subsequently influence that culture's underlying beliefs. Primarily, Buddhism is practiced mostly in the nations of Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Laos, Taiwan, China, Japan, Mongolia, Tibet, Bhutan, Vietnam, and finally Hong Kong. But friend, it's also on the rise within this nation and Europe. It influences more people than you think, especially within the celebrity circus. Now let me give you a list of some celebrities now who practice Buddhism and you might be surprised at some of these. They would include Jennifer Aniston, Orlando Bloom, Angelina Jolie, John Cleese, Richard Gere, George Lucas, Courtney Love, Jennifer Lopez, Sarah Jessica Parker, Brad Pitt, Oliver Stone, Steve Wynn, Mark Zuckerberg, Keanu Reeves, Steve Jobs, Patrick Duffy and finally Penelope Cruz. Anything but the truth, right? Friend, I find it ironic that celebrities who live lavish lifestyles follow a religion which at its core claims that human desire is the source of all suffering. Well, these guys aren't really denying themselves very much or living out their so-called faith. Not many people realize that Buddhism stems from Hinduism. The founder of Buddhism was a gentleman called Siddhartha Gautama, and he was born in 560 BC in the town of Kapilavastu, which at the time was in northeastern India, but is now the nation of Nepal. To give you a flavor of what time period this was, we're talking about a thousand years before Islam originated. This was also the time when Haggai and Zephaniah were doing their prophetic rounds, and Carthage was one of the dominant military forces in Europe. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. Now, Siddhartha's father was a feudal lord, and when his son was a late teenager, he married a local princess. Now, Gautama's life was one of vast opulence and comfort. He grew up in the household of a lord and married a princess. This man was naive and led a very sheltered life. Now, just as King Solomon documented in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he rapidly grew very dissatisfied with his luxurious lifestyle by his early 20s. The legend of the four passing sights tells how he became aware of the world's suffering in spite of his parents' best efforts to shelter him from the rest of the world. One day he saw an old man, a person suffering from a disease, a dead man, and a shaven monk. On this fateful day, he saw for the first time that great suffering does exist within the world, and as a result of this, he chose a path of renunciation or repudiation. In layman's terms, he chose a life of self-denial. However, friend, it's very easy for a man barely out of his teens, married to a princess, to choose a life of self-denial, isn't it? When you start with everything to begin with, but it's much harder to be so self-sacrificial if you're born in the gutters of Calcutta or Delhi, for example. Now, when Gautama was 29 years old, he abandoned his family and began his search for enlightenment, which is the final blessed state marked by the absence of desire or suffering. He went and visited various Hindu masters and then decided to become a dedicated ascetic. Friend, if you're not familiar with asceticism, it's a lifestyle characterized by few possessions or luxuries. It's a rigorous self-denial of bodily pleasures and needs. However, it also believes the physical body is evil, and therefore Gautama, who practiced this for six consecutive months, would often beat and cut himself in deeds of self-mortification. So much so, in fact, that he nearly died of his wounds, coming very close to the point of death in his pursuit of self-denial. You know, it wasn't just Gautama who believed in asceticism, which was a means to enlightenment, according to him. Socrates also believed that self-restraint was the foundation of all virtue, and therefore asceticism was an integral part of the educational traditions of the Greeks, although beating oneself, like Gautama, is not well documented within the Greek culture. 
So after realizing that beating yourself to death wasn't the path to enlightenment as he perceived it, Gautama practiced what he called the middle path by keeping himself from the extremes of asceticism and indulgence by using meditation. During one of these periods of long meditation, while sitting under a fig tree, he allegedly attained enlightenment. So much so, he entered the state of Nirvana. The state of Nirvana is a place, according to Buddhists, where personal desire becomes extinct, and there is no longer individual consciousness. You could call it their heaven, and Gautama claimed he reached this place while he was still alive. Once he attained this enlightenment in 525 BC, he then became the Buddha, or the Enlightened One, and the tree under which he sat came to be known as the Bow, or Bodhi, meaning Wisdom Tree. Now, does that sound familiar, friend? Do you remember another tree of wisdom or knowledge in the garden in Genesis 2.9? Could it be that Buddha was somehow influenced by the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Obviously, this was not the same tree, friend, as it was in the garden, certainly. But he came to the realization of salvation through knowledge rather than by saving grace through faith in Christ. As I said before, there are two branches in this world. One branch represents saving grace through faith in Christ, and another represents salvation through knowledge. And this is the path all false religions take, including the mystery religions, and Buddhism is no different. Friend, none of us can be saved through knowledge, whether it's either esoteric or exoteric. Now, for the next 45 years, Gautama, or Buddha, built a large corps of disciples and proclaimed his message in northern India. His disciples knew him only as the Buddha, amongst several other names, and he eventually died of food poisoning in 480 BC. What's interesting is that Buddha's approach to religion was diametrically opposed from Hinduism, out of which it had come. Hinduism followed philosophical speculation, rituals, magic, and superstition. Buddha also rejected the caste system of India and any forms or ritual of occultism. So he definitely had a desire for truth and also hated injustice. Buddhism put a heavy emphasis on desire as the source of suffering and identified the achievement of selflessness as the cure for this situation. Of course, we as Christians know that desire is not the issue at all. By denying desires that are godly even, very little is achieved for good in this life. I call Buddhism the religion that tunes out and checks out, because their existence is based on distancing themselves from their community and total self-absorption in the pursuit of nirvana. Now here are some of the tenets of Buddhism, some of which are noble certainly, but without a savior all of them are redundant. Number one, desire causes suffering. Two, personal peace will be found when we abide in that which is permanent. Three, it is best to live a moral life. Four, self-discipline has spiritual value. Five, meditation and prayer are important. And finally, number six, compassion is a virtue that should be nurtured. Friend, based on this list, Buddha was certainly searching, and you could argue he was not far from the kingdom of God in many ways. He definitely came up with a pretty good list of attributes to live a successful life, and some of these are quite scriptural. For example, number two, to abide in that which is permanent, is to abide in Father God and His Word. It's certainly better to live a moral life, as God says, and certainly prayer and meditation are important within the context of God's Word. But meditation, of course, from a Christian viewpoint, is focusing and muttering God's word under one's breath, not clearing the mind to make it more susceptible to demonic suggestion or influence. In many ways, Buddhists are seeking the truth, but they've come up with their own false framework or path to attain it. In Buddha's time, living on the other side of the world, of course, he would have no access to the Hebraic scriptures, some of which were still being written. But once more, God makes it clear that his creation and the conscience we are born with are also witnesses for him. If Buddha came to the realization there is a one true God, then God will not hold it against him. But at that time, Christ had not yet come. But as for John Cleese and Sarah Jessica Parker and George Lucas, etc., Christ came 2,000 years ago, and they are without excuse. Now, when it comes to practicing monks today, they follow an order laid down by Buddha in his lifetime called the Triple Jewel, which comprises of Buddha, Dharma, which is the law, and Sangha, which is the congregation. Each devout monk must have a shaven head, wear a yellow robe, practice meditation, and affirm the doctrines of Buddha contained within this Triple Jewel. 
Their goal in their lifetime is the attainment of the state of Nirvana as Buddha supposedly accomplished sitting under his fig tree after long hours of meditation. In their Buddhist order, these monks sit under a teacher who are bound by ten vows, which are neither to kill nor steal, to abstain from impurity, falsehood, and intoxicating drinks, not to eat at forbidden times, to abstain from the folly of dancing, singing, music, and theater, to use no manner of adornment, not to sleep in a high or a broad bed, and to receive neither gold nor silver. The monks are also bound to celibacy and poverty, and they cannot be ordained before their 20th year. Twice a month, the monks of each monastery assemble for the confession of sin, and annually a retreat is held both for rest from the pilgrimage and to gain new strength for the coming season. Even in the lifetime of Buddha, women were admitted to the order and nunneries were built for their accommodation. Friend, sin is the reason for suffering in the world, not desire, as Buddha claims. No matter how long one meditates under a tree or stares at a whitewashed wall, you'll never achieve so-called enlightenment or the path to nirvana. This, my friend, is a lie from the pit of hell, and quite frankly, it's a self-obsessive compulsion to spend hours alone in pursuit of something that doesn't exist. Buddhists today are deeply dissatisfied and frustrated with a false hope that one day they will reach this so-called place of nirvana. But the truth is, friend, they desire salvation through Christ like everyone else and require a savior to be rid of their sin issue, not their desire issue. Meditation is not the way, friend. Unfortunately, friend, this religion is another vain attempt by Satan to counterfeit Christianity by offering it as another path that leads to frustration in this life and eternal damnation in the next. None of these counterfeits confront or overcome the problem of sin. No form of Buddhism has a place for the biblical doctrines of God, man, salvation, or resurrection. Most Buddhists are either pantheistic or atheistic. Friend, beware also of the practice of yoga in the United States. Yoga fronts itself as a form of bodily exercise, but as one progresses in its practice, it focuses more on the meditative or spiritual aspects of yoga. This practice of meditation is rooted in Buddhism in the pursuit of enlightenment, as I've explained. Since the 1960s, yoga has been on the rise and it teaches disciplines that run parallel with Buddhism. You could say that yoga is the evangelistic division of Buddhism, but without the Western mindset being aware of its darker agenda, it lulls people into its frustrating practice of meditation which desires to clear the mind. Therefore, in this clear state of mind, it becomes more receptive to demonic attack and programming. Some yoga practitioners espouse there's a dormant special force at the base of the spine called Kundalini, or better known as the coiled serpent. This special force is supposed to rise up within the mystical points of the body toward the brain, culminating in a feeling of euphoria or bliss, and finally making the connection with the Sakti, one of the goddesses of Hinduism. Friend, if your yoga instructor desires to get spiritual, then run out of the door as fast as you can. This is nothing more than communing with the demonic realm and very dangerous. As with other cults, Buddhism wears a cloak of benevolence and masks itself as a means to better humanity, but it has fallen into idol worship, mystical practices, and a path to salvation through knowledge. We need to reach out to our Buddhist brothers and sisters with a gospel friend and engage them when we have an opportunity. I also wish to thank Dr. Kenneth Boer for granting me permission to use some of his source material in this broadcast today. You've been listening to Carl Joseph and the Lions Unchained podcast. Carl is a minister who's witnessed God's supernatural power to save, heal, and deliver. Carl is a unique researcher who investigates current affairs, societal trends, technology, cults, and end-time events, all through a biblical lens. Every Monday, new podcasts are uploaded, so stay tuned for the next opportunity to roar into victory. Check out carljosephministries.com for exciting articles, teachings, and discussion points. See you next week, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button 